Hey you all, Farmer Jesse here. Uh, first, apologies about the clickbaity title. Summer cover crops is not a clickbaity phrase. I gotta get out more. But I wanted to, before summer was over, get you pumped about summer cover cropping and how and where to use this idea because unlike winter cover crops, where your options for things that will survive a winter are relatively limited, summer is wide freaking open in terms of diversity of annual crops you can use. However, like all cover cropping, it's really easy to screw it up. So in this video, we're going to break down how to evaluate which summer cover crops to use, when and where to use them, how, and maybe a little bit of why, because why is my favorite question, and all that good stuff. So let's do it. You don't have a favorite question? Everyone has a favorite question, right? First things first, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. And if you gain something from this video or any of our videos, you can always support our work at patreon.com slash no-till growers or by picking up a copy of the Living Soil Handbook specifically from notillgrowers.com where the proceeds go to making you more content like this. Okay, so for the uninitiated, I'm going to go over some cover crop basics real quick, but because I don't like wasting anyone's time beyond forcing you to listen to some of my bad dad jokes, if you already understand the basics of summer cover cropping and just want the cover crop mixes and strategy, skip to this time here in the video. For the rest of you, some context. First, why even bother with cover cropping at all? especially in the summer, why shouldn't you just use a cash crop there instead of a cover crop that doesn't earn you money? Honestly, in some circumstances, skipping the cover crop would be my recommendation. Uh, smaller scales for one, where every square foot of growing space is ultra precious, that's a good reason to not cover crop. Uh, or for instance, if you are in an arid climate and have to irrigate everything that you plant, you may as well be planting something that will earn you money if it's going to cost you money or resources to grow it. Um, in terms of soil health, growing anything, indeed even a cash crop, is better than growing nothing. That said, just because you have the space does not necessarily mean you have the market or the means to harvest and sell every crop that you can grow or that you can plant. Uh, could you develop those things? Definitely. Just make sure that you have the time and resources to dedicate to it. But in the meantime, summer cover crops make an excellent low stress placeholder so you can focus on the crops you'd plan to sell or just have something growing in between cash crops. Uh, an example of in between would be like if you want to plant your fall brassicas after your garlic, for instance, in many regions you, you will have a full month or two between garlic harvest and planting brassicas, or at least a few weeks. So a quick round of summer buckwheat or cow peas or both would fit nicely there just to hold that spot and keep that soil happy and fed. Could you develop a rotation that doesn't allow for awkward gaps like that? Totally. But if you're going to have some awkward gaps and you probably will from time to time, you may as well fill them with something that feeds the soil. Speaking of feeding the soil, sometimes you have a bed or a plot that just doesn't perform well for whatever reason, and sticking another crop in there may be a waste of money until you get that spot back to health. A summer cover crop could help revitalize that spot a bit leading into the fall planting season or the winter. Um, cover crops do this by creating a significant amount of above ground but more so below ground biomass though so above ground it'll act as a mulch below ground it'll act as food and habitat for microbes cover crops also do a lot of really excellent stuff for the soil like gathering nutrients and increasing microbial populations and improving soil respiration soil respiration just being the primary source of the carbon dioxide plants need in photosynthesis right co2 water sunlight photosynthesis uh, basically as microbes eat and die and do their microbial thing they give off carbon dioxide plants use that co2 to grow it's part of the carbon cycle and it's also part of a digression Sorry. Cover crops also just help hold the soil in place and keep it from washing away or blowing away. I would keep going, but you should just watch this playlist here for all sorts of good cover cropping advice and insight instead, because it's time to talk about some different cover crop varieties. First, let's discuss buckwheat because it's the fastest and the easiest to kill and perhaps the most common of all summer cover crops. Uh, because buckwheat takes about 30 days to flower depending on weather and soil temperature. Because of that, I do not mix it into other cover crops generally before the other cover crops have matured. It will simply go to seed, by that I mean 
become a weed before other cover crops have fully matured. So if I do add buckwheat to a mix, I sow the buckwheat one or even two weeks after I sow the original mix usually with a cedar to get that seed to soil contact. But I like it on its own. Kitty cat, you can't do that. You're always rubbing the camera thing. But I like it on its own for a quick and easy cover crop that gets the soil covered and makes excellent fodder for beneficials. What do you think? <laughs> you seem unhappy. Not a cover crop fan. Note that if biomass is what you're after, buckwheat is not your cover crop. It won't hurt, but it's not as much of a biomass producer above ground or below ground as say, legumes or especially grains. But there is some evidence that buckwheat and especially when it's paired with peas may help make things like calcium more bioavailable to the subsequent crop. So if you plan to grow say a late round of determinate tomatoes that need a lot of available calcium, buckwheat could be a good predecessor. Before I go on, just keep in mind that I have not tried every single cover crop that's out there, nor every combination. So as always, I encourage you to put your insight in the comment section or kitty. Our comment section is weirdly awesome for a YouTube channel. So make sure to read through there for more ideas and comment if you can make it more awesomer. Awesomer. Hmm. It's early. Okay, so let's talk summer grains for a minute. And as I go through some of these, I will also shout out some ways to mix them. First thing you should know is that cover crop grains are annual grasses, and because they are annual grasses, they can be jerks to terminate, like any grass. Um, in the world of no-till, if you do not want to turn your soil over at all, the ability to terminate cover crops without tillage is going to be a huge guiding factor for you in choosing the cover crops that you want to plant. So just keep that in mind. But that's especially true with grains slash grasses. I will discuss termination more presently. And of course, I talked about killing cover crops recently in this video here. So check that out as well. But let's first di just discuss a couple summer grains. Uh, my favorite go-to is sorghum Sudan grass. This is a hybrid of sorghum and Sudan grass. That is an amazing biomass producer. According to managing cover crops profitably from sayer.org, which is free to download and an absolutely incredible resource that you should have on your computer. Uh, according to that book, sorghum Sudan grass is great for nematode suppression and for breaking up compaction. But for us on our new farm, that is in only year two of production and still in the building soil stage, the more important factor is that it is an incredible biomass producer. It's also fast growing and resistant to droughts. Uh, beyond being a little difficult to kill, there's no reason to exclude this from your mix. I will say though that birds love the germinated sprouts like they love say sweet corn sprouts. So just be aware that you may want to slightly up your rates of this grain to avoid it getting completely annihilated. In a mix, half a pound to one full pound per 1000 square feet will probably do you just fine, but you may want to take notes and adjust for the next year. And people ask me about seeding rates all the time when it comes to cover crops, and it's just really complicated. It depends a bit on what you mix and on the number of varieties. There's no simple answer, but the recommendation I made in the Living Soil Handbook, where I also go way more in depth on cover cropping than I could possibly do in a video, is to use the seeding rates recommended by the purveyor, but divide it by the number of crops in the mix. So if the seed purveyor recommends two pounds of something per thousand square feet, and you have four cover crops in the mix, I would go closer to one half pound per 1000 square feet for that particular crop. Does that make sense? You may have to listen to that again. There's not really an exact science here, and every year the seeds will be a little different depending on where they came from and who grew them. Uh, so just take notes and try some different densities to see what works. I usually err on the side of too much than too little to avoid thin stands. Uh, real quick, some other grains I like are hybrid pearl millet, though sometimes it goes to seed a little faster than I want it to. I also really like regular Sudan grass and regular sorghum. Um, in fact, I got some red sorghum that is absolutely beautiful from my buddy Susanna Lane at Salamander Springs uh, that I'm trying to raise enough seed to add to my mixes every year. Um, one other bonus grass I've seen used is actually lemongrass. I saw this amazing lemongrass stand at my buddy Jenny Love's place at Love and Fresh Flowers in Philadelphia. 
and I was super jealous. It was beautiful. Um, lemongrass is a bit of a slow grower, which I can relate to because I haven't grown in years. But if you have a spot that lemongrass could be under sowed, perhaps that could work. Uh, it does not go to seed easily and dies easily in the couple frosts. So anyway, cool choice of cover crops and super interesting potential there for lemongrass and things like that. Maybe even as a long season cover crop slash cash crop couple notes on grains is that they can be managed during the season with a very high mowing which basically sort of kills some of the roots and, and thus kind of increases their organic matter. Um, you have to mow it around 12 inches high if possible but at least six. A scythe is not decent for doing this like I'm doing here with the spring wheat and clearly you don't even have to know how to scythe. Yep. You can also graze mini cover crops, especially these grains that grow back so well, uh, which is fun, but just make sure the animals have access to plenty of less protein rich fodder as well so they don't get scours and bloat. Um, and don't leave them on too long if you want regrowth at all. Uh, anyway, we sadly got rid of our sheep when we moved to a new farm with less pasture. So look to rotational grazers for info on that. Um, I will say that mowing can decrease a cover crop's density sometimes. So it's may, so it may be worth sowing some buckwheat or something right before you mow to fill in those gaps. For grain termination, winter is the most reliable thing. Summer grains like these mostly all die pretty easily in a freeze or a couple frosts. Uh, mowing or crimping and then tarping can work pretty well, but leave yourself at least three hot weeks under the tarp to get a reliable kill on those grains. All right, let's talk about legumes because there are a few good summer legumes that deserve a lot of attention. Um, cow peas and any sort of beans in particular, um, especially the longer season ones that are not gonna go to seed really quickly. And you can just mow most of them low to the ground to kill them, which I like because going from photosynthesizing plant to another photosynthesizing plant as quickly as possible is what the soil would prefer. So if I can skip the tarp, great. Also beans and cow peas and mung beans, and they, these are all things that love to germinate in the heat. Being legumes, so long as the rhizobium bacteria is present or you have inoculated them with some from a bag, which is fine, uh, they will help fix nitrogen for the next crop. I also really like the legumes sun hemp and sespania in a mix as well because they are weird tall plants but both very good nitrogen fixers and decent for biomass. Uh, the seed on those last two can be a little harder to find and a bit more expensive but worth experimenting with if you can get some. All right next something I love to mix into cover crop mixes is flowers. I love flowers in our cover crop mixes. I love flowers all over the garden. Sunflowers are really good because they are fairly fast growing and tall, but you can mix in basically anything from cosmos and zinnias to tithonia and borage. We often plant a lot of flowers in the odd areas of our farm that aren't fit for crops and then use the leftover flower seed in our cover crop mixes because it is a rad sight to see flowers in all that green. Uh, flowers are cool too because they are often not in the same family as most stuff we grow except sunflowers of course which are lettuce family or something like sweet alyssum which is in the brassica family but beautiful great for pollinators flowers for the win. Some other summary things I like to add that don't fall into these above categories are brassicas, like radishes. Um, I love mixing radishes and turnips into summer cover crops. I love adding beets as well. And pro tip, just buy the microgreen beets because they tend to be a little bit cheaper um, or at least compare the price. You are not looking for the actual beet. You just need the foliage and photosynthate photosynthate being kind of the unique product it creates when it photosynthesizes from that crop family. Uh, they germinate well in the summer too, uh, though they can be a little bit slow to grow. Beets and radishes make excellent fillers though. That's kind of why I like them. Sprawling cucurbits are another one I try and mix in because they just love to get in where they can just fill in gaps. Literally, they will just move around the ground looking to fill in wherever there is sunlight. Um, that would be like pumpkins and cucumbers and that sort of stuff. Uh, speaking of vines, one thing I'm playing with this year is using sweet potatoes. We always have a big mass of sweet potato slips after we plant. So I wanted to take clumps of those extras and have them help me get some beds in this cat tunnel right here ready for winter production because those three beds in that tunnel are arguably the worst on the property for drainage and soil organic matter and just need some assistance. So I wanted to do a quick cover cropping to see if I could have a better winter out of those beds.
Some fast and dirty cover crop notes, always direct seed where possible as you will get better germination every time if it's in the soil. If you can't direct seed for whatever reason, lightly rake the bed top after broadcasting and even roll over it if you can with a roller if you have one or something to press the seeds into the soil. I cannot emphasize this next phrase enough, seed to soil contact. That's critical for germination. Seeds are not going to germinate really well just resting atop the soil unless it just rains for multiple days in a row. If my mix contains small seeds and large ones, I will broadcast the small ones first and then run over them directly with the seeder with the large seeds, usually the earthway seeder because it has bigger seed plates to house larger seeds. But I will run over that bed, basically just pushing those small seeds into the soil and simultaneously sowing larger seeds. Then a light raking and a good watering over top or raining uh, should do the trick to get them going. Also, I provide a whole appendix in the Living Soil Handbook about over 30 different cover crops and their benefits and uses and termination. But if you want to get a little bit more precise, because you could, in theory, manage a lot of your soil deficiencies through the use of dedicated cover crop mixes. Besides nutrient management though, uh, very generally speaking, if you're trying to just hold the soil down for a couple months, and enrich it a bit, mix some sunflowers perhaps with some legumes and maybe some brassicas like radishes or those beets, easy stuff to kill and grow. Or alternatively, if you're trying to create a nice mulch going into the winter, go with some of those grains. And if you just have a month or so and need a fast cover, go with the buckwheat and maybe a bean or two. One note on biology, I always try to rub the cover crops with some vermicast or some sort of compost where I can just to get a good jump start on the biology before I broadcast or sow it. I've also been playing more and more with using things like the four row pinpoint seeder to under sow summer cover crops under things like, uh, I don't know, okra. I always sow some winter covers in there too, like rye and crimson clover so that the bed stays green long after the okra has senesced. Anyway, for more cover cropping stuff, I will point you to the Living Soil Handbook and to managing cover crops profitably and to our comment section for more, because again, we have a lot of great commenters. Uh, anyway, I gotta get to planting. So like the video if you like the video, make sure to subscribe to the channel if you are not already subscribed. Join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash no-till growers to support all of the work that we do, including these videos. I guess that's it. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye. It's important that you see what's going on in my feet here. It's pajamas and kitty cats. Kitty kitty. <laughs>